ES Audio. From the Evening Standard in London, I'm John Weeks, and this is The Leader. The UK's worsening energy situation has escalated even further today as BP announced record profits, while people's gas and electricity bills are set to rise even further. The energy firm reported almost £7 billion of profits during the second quarter, its highest in 14 years. It has figures from Cornwall Insight predict annual energy bills could typically rise to more than £3,200 from October and more than £3,300 from January. That's compared with just over £1,000 a year in September last year, according to Ofgem. The news from BP has led to some campaign groups calling it a cost of greed crisis. To talk us through it is the Evening Standard's business editor, Jonathan Prynne. So, John, with the planned hikes in the energy bill cap and this record profit announcement from BP, the numbers don't seem to add up, do they? Well, it doesn't look very good uh, if you're a consumer waiting for your bills to go up by absolutely unprecedented amounts. They've gone up once already this year, but they'll be going up again massively in the autumn and through the winter. So when you look at BP making such huge amounts of profit, you inevitably start asking the question, how can they be allowed to make such vast profits for their shareholders when we consumers are having to fork out you know, unprecedented amounts for our bills? But in a way, they're two sides of the same coin. And it's all to do with higher wholesale global energy prices, which for the companies that produce the crude oil or the gas that ultimately ends up as the juice coming into your home or your or the petrol going into your car, they they are able to make, you know, terrific profits cost the same more or less to get it out of the ground, but they can sell it on at the market price at a a huge profit. To be fair to BP, the profit wasn't all about uh, high oil and gas prices. They also increased their margins in refining and oil trading. But, you know, there's no getting away from it. These are absolutely bumper times for the what they call the oil majors, uh, the big, the, the really big energy companies. But those high prices that are contributing to high profits for the companies are also what ultimately contribute to the high prices that you and I will be paying every month for our heating and lighting and and all the rest of the energy that we consume at a household level. So what are BP saying about these record profits? Have they released a statement alongside them? Yeah, I mean, BP's line, you know, all the big oil companies would say that they operate through a cycle and sometimes the cycle is good for shareholders when oil prices or, or gas prices are very high. And sometimes, you know, it's very bad when the oil price or the gas price collapses. And don't forget a few years ago, you know, it was down to sort of half or a third of of current levels. So I think that's one argument that they would make. The other is that we all want to see a decarbonisation of our economies. And to do that, the energy companies need to make vast investments in alternative sources of energy, such as sort of renewables and wind wind farms and, and solar and, and all the other forms of renewable energy. But, you know, the research and development that's required to build them up to a large scale or a large enough scale to serve, you know, significant numbers of the population, that requires absolutely, you know, heroic amounts of investment. And you can only invest if you've got the profits there to plow back into investment or to, you know, support the funding that you need to make the investment. So that would be their main case, I think. And can you see the government intervening any further and doing something to recoup some of those profits so that they can support people with their bills? Yes, I can. I really can. I think the public mood is quite dark on this sort of thing. You know, shareholders had a good day today. It was a 10% increase in the dividend. The share price went up 4%. So You know, shareholders in BP, who don't forget, are often the pension funds that we all rely on for our retirement as well. So it's not just sort of, you know, faceless money men. But all shareholders in BP have had a very good day today. But there does seem to be a disconnect, as I think you suggested in your first question, that people are really suffering. Lots of people, millions of people are going to really suffer over this coming winter at a time when the the companies that benefit from producing you know the raw materials that become the energy 
are making such monumental profits. And if you, I mean, bear in mind that the the big energy companies together, we're not just talking about BP, but if you put them all together, have made something like I think it's about sixty billion dollars in this quarter alone, the second quarter of the year, which is utterly unprecedented. And you know, since oil first started gushing out of the ground, so. I think the politicians will come under a lot of pressure. There is clearly going to have to be more support for consumers over the winter. I think that's undoubted. Where's that going to come from? Is it all going to come from the government? Well, probably not because they've got their own problems with the with the public finances. Where do you close the gap? You close the gap by tapping up the the energy companies who are making such large profits. So I think we will see an increased or a second round a windfall taxes uh, or something i think that's quite likely let's take a break now coming up in part 2 ruth london from fuel poverty action reckons people will turn to even more extreme methods of protest if things don't change you know people's idea of what is legal and what is illegal and what is drastic action you know is going to change Joining me now is Ruth London from campaign group Fuel Poverty Action. So Ruth, what was your reaction to the news today about BP's profits? Well, it's all of them, isn't it? All of these big oil companies, they've just got their nose in the trough. They're making billions. And at the same time, people are going hungry to pay the bills. Those profits don't come from the sky. They come from our bills. They come from people putting money aside to feed their prepayment meters, even when their children are hungry. The scandal of them being allowed to just put prices up more and more, not because of any rising costs, just because they can, just because they're speculating on energy markets. It's entirely unacceptable that the government is allowing this to happen. And in fact, is still subsidizing fossil fuel companies like them, paying them 91 pence in the pound for money that they're going to invest, pouring public money from our taxes into these corporations that are doing nothing but, you know, leaving people hungry and cold and also destroying the planet, you know, investing money in further exploration and drilling for oil and gas when everybody knows that they're destroying the earth and the future and even the present. You know, everything we hold dear is is going up in smoke. And yet, you know, it seems to continue as if nothing could be done about it. And earlier this year, you started your Energy for All campaign. Can you tell us about that? We think that every household is entitled to enough energy to cover the basics like heating, lighting, keeping the fridge on, keeping connected. You know, we all need digital appliances now. If if only to charge your phone, you need electricity. And people who uh, don't have enough to cover those basics do end up in the dark, in the cold, and without being connected. When you're on a prepayment meter, for instance, and it clicks off. When you have to pay a standing charge, which is a massive part of the bill for many people, before you can even get any power out of your prepayment meter. And the standing charge is a scandal in itself. So we're campaigning for the standing charge to be abolished for people needs to be covered so that if you do need a lot of power, for instance, you know, if you have medical uh, devices that need to be run by electricity, that would be covered. And it would be covered in kind, not in cash, would get our needs met in kind, not in money that is devalued by inflation and devalued when the prices go up. You know, the handouts that the government gave so far, you know, they make a little dent but they in no way meet what's being expected for our bills, you know, this autumn and to go up again in the winter. And there's no way that people can pay those. So, you know, there has to be some energy security. It begins at home. It's not a matter of international diplomacy. Energy security has to begin with people having what we need and having it in a way that doesn't destroy the planet while we're doing it. And I understand you've also this week backed the cause of campaign group Don't Pay UK, who are trying to get a million people to commit to cancelling their energy direct debits in October. Why has Fuel Poverty Action got behind that? Because so many people can't pay. And because we think that if people are uh, forced into not paying, 
some solidarity from people who perhaps could pay, but are ready to take a stand and say these prices are impossible, something has to be done differently. That's much better for us all to take a stand together. Now, not everybody can. First of all, uh, if you're on a prepayment meter, you can't not pay because you won't have any power or, you know, or heat. Uh, secondly, uh, there can be risks involved. There can be risks to people's credit ratings, and some people depend on that. You know, for mortgages, for instance, uh, there can be risks of late fees, you know, people having to pay more. There are ways that people have to make an individual judgment about whether they can take part in the campaign that way. But we think that people who can do that are making a move that will help drive home to the government and to the energy companies that something radical has to change. And we think that the something radical begins with a fair energy system that turns pricing on its head because at the moment people pay more for energy if they use less. You know, if you cut down, you're paying more per unit because of the standing charge. We think it should be other w the other way around, that what people actually need, the minimum, the basics, should actually be free. And then you pay more if you're profligate with it. You know, the wealthy households that are heating a swimming pool. Why are we paying higher prices than them? It doesn't make sense. So Energy for All would turn that on its head and make sure that people can cover our basic needs. And we think that Don't Pay is making demands that move in that direction. So we're glad to support that. And we've seen a real insurgence of extreme campaigning over the last few years with the likes of Insulate Britain and Don't Stop Oil blocking the roads. Now Don't Pay UK threatening to cancel people's direct debits. Do you think we're heading for even more extreme forms of protests going forward? I think people have no choice when the forms of protest that people have relied on are just not listened to. You know, we have a petition with 407,000 signatures for Energy for All. We'll be handing it in uh, in September. Keep an eye out and people can look on our website, fuelpovertyaction.org.uk. Look on our website and you'll find, you know, the petition and other uh, ways to campaign for energy for all and for insulation, for the right to keep warm and healthy. But there's so far you can go before people crack. Stealing, if you talk about stealing, what about the theft of billions of pounds of customers' money, you know, which is going to speculate and to put in people's private pockets who are obscenely wealthy to begin with and to invest in further you know, exploration and drilling for, for oil that's destroying the planet, you know, f stealing everything that is dear to us for the sake of profit, you know, the sake of a market that doesn't work, you know, that doesn't work for people. So that's the big theft. And I think, you know, people's idea of what is legal and what is illegal and what is drastic action, you know, is going to change because that grand theft that's happening that's the biggest crime and that's the most extreme action. There's more on this story in the Evening Standard newspaper and online at standard.co.uk. That's The Leader. Thanks for listening. We're back tomorrow at 4pm.